past six years, we have staged the university's Constitution Day lecture. Uh, as you may know from walking around campus today, there have been various Constitution celebrations, pocket Constitutions uh, were being handed out at the Shine Center. I wanted to have them airdropped, <laughs> injuring people. We also have a chalking of constitutional uh, clauses at, out on the plot, uh, but the kind of culmination and capstone experience for our Constitution Day commemoration is always the lecture. Uh, in the past, we've had uh, um, various academics, uh, we've also had judges, um, and we had journalists. And today, we're very lucky to have with us a distinguished journalist, Susan Arbetter. Uh, Susan, I actually have a little paragraph on her achievement. She asked me to be brief, but I told her uh, I must be truthful. And there are <laughs> achievements here that, that must be told. Uh, and uh, so I want you to know that Susan is an award-winning broadcast journalist. She was the creator and host of the radio program Roundtable Show and of the television program New York Now. Currently, uh, Susan hosts and produces the Capitol Press Room. Uh, which is a daily WCNY radio show broadcast from the state capitol in Albany. The Capitol Press Room features interviews with newsmakers and the people uh, that cover them. So uh, it's kind of a who's who of New York State <laughs> government, really. I mean, she interviews everybody, and she has also interviewed, uh, interviewed journalists in the New York Times, Albany Times Union, Gannett News Service, and the Associated Press. She also hosts the Capitol Report, a television news show covering New York State Legislature and statewide government. The Capitol Press Room and the Capitol Report are carried by stations throughout New York. And if you tuned in yesterday at WRVO, uh, you got to hear me uh, stumbling through an expert interview by Susan. Well, I always thought I had a good face for radio. That's how I always believed. Uh, but Susan's title of the lecture today is New York State's Constitution, Sometimes It's Just a Suggestion. Let me, before I turn over the podium to Susan, tell you a little bit about the protocol today. Susan plans to speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A with the audience. Uh, at 5 o'clock, we'll conclude the lecture and Q&A portion of the event. We'll have a reception right here in this room. So that table at the back will be laden with food, yay and verily groaning under the weight of pizza and subs. So I hope that you stay until 5 o'clock and take advantage of the opportunity for continued conversation about what I'm sure is going to be a very interesting lecture. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Susan Arbeck. It is actually an honor for me to be here at the Syracuse University College of Law on a day when we celebrate uh, a document that gives us a right as Americans to public de publicly debate the merits of that document. I was half joking when I suggested the title of this speech today, <laughs> but I was thrilled when Keith Bybee embraced it with such enthusiasm. Thrilled, but not surprised, considering his scholarship revolves around the reality that judges are influenced by politics. Not that this is news to anyone in this room, but if judges are influenced by politics, then lawmakers, politicians, are the ones who are doing the influencing. Whether we like it or not, politics is a part of every decision our elected officials make, every bill they write, and every constitutional provision they decide to adhere to, or flout, and they flout. They're flouting all over the place. Although considering some of the questionable provisions in the New York State Constitution, sometimes that's a good thing. But one Albany political veteran I spoke with suggested that there are parts of the state constitution simply crying out to be ignored. Before I continue, there are a couple of things that I want to clarify. First, that this is a discussion that's limited to the New York State Constitution. Some of the constitutional experts I have spoken with have told me that the US Constitution and the New York State Constitution do not demand equal reverence, regardless of what you said on the radio yesterday. <laughs> well, to most Americans, the US Constitution is the foundation of our democracy, a manifestation of our American values. The New York State Constitution just isn't in the same league. New York is not alone here. Other state constitutions are just as problematic. Justice William Brennan calls states laboratories of democracy. And as you know, experiments that take place in laboratories aren't always successful. The New York State Constitution is unwieldy. 
whereas the federal constitution is sleek with about 8,500 words, the state's constitution is flabby. It is in need of a good edit. It also doesn't always mean what it says. Dr. Gerald Benjamin, distinguished professor of political science at SUNY New Paltz, co-founder of the Effective New York Project and former principal researcher for the New York State Constitutional Revision Commission, recently wrote, in place after place, the Constitution includes substance that need not be in the Constitution. In place after place, the document simply does not mean what it appears to say. One good government advocate told me that he suspects <coughs> that there are several constitutional scholars who, if pressed, might even call portions of the document ridiculous. Peter J. Gailey, professor emeritus of political science at Canisius College and author of The New York State Constitution, A Reference Guide, Second Edition, told me that he thinks the document is a disgrace. This brings me to the second thing I need to clarify, and that is that I am not a constitutional scholar. I am lucky enough to have access to some people who are, and to prepare for this lecture, I have read material written by or spoken directly with true constitutional scholars, including Peter Gailey and Jerry Benjamin, Dr. Thomas Geis, and Dr. Richard Brufo. I also enlisted the help of uh, some of my buddies, some veteran politicos who have been steeping in Albany's political pond for so long that they're practically pruning and they know how things work. They include, but are not limited to, the Fiscal Policy Institute's Frank Morrow, NYPERG's Legislative Director Blair Horner, and political strategist Bruce Giori. So as I mentioned, I'm not a scholar, but I am an observer of New York State government and politics, which is to say that I watch as elected officials occasionally leap off the end of the intellectual trapeze and tumble Cirque du Soleil-like into private contortions of logic in order to get what they want, regardless of constitutionality. And sometimes what they want, and what the majority of voters want, is not mutually exclusive. And we're going to start there with gambling. It's an issue that's come to represent the gulf between reality and what's written in the state constitution, or what Professor Gailey calls the maw between the document and texts on the ground. According to Jerry Benjamin, the New York State Constitution's general prohibition against gambling provides that there be no lottery or the sale of lottery tickets, no pool selling, bookmaking, or any kind of gambling in the state. However, the Constitution does have some exceptions to this ban, and these include lotteries operated by the state to aid or support education, paramutual betting on horses that produce a reasonable revenue for the support of government. Bingo, lotto, or numbers games with prizes given on the basis of chance, again to benefit bona fide religious, charitable, or nonprofit organizations. As anyone who's visited Turning Stone or the Monticello Raceway knows, in addition to that list, though, New York State also offers Native American casinos as well as non native racinos, which fall under the lottery exception for some bizarre reason. Former Republican State Senator Frank Padavan of Queens was famous for pointing out how far our state gambling interests had evolved. The website Effective New York, run by the New Roosevelt Initiative, published a summary of gambling opportunities that Senator Padavan wrote back in 2004, which I will now paraphrase for you. In 1967, the lottery was limited to a monthly drawing with a top prize of $100,000. In 1976, it was expanded to include instant lottery. In 1978, Lotto was born. In 1980 and 81, the daily numbers game and win four were introduced respectively. In 1988, it was pick 10. In 92, it was take five. In 95, it was quick, quick draw, which started out as a game you played every five minutes. Currently, it's allowed to be played every four minutes. The sale of instant scratch-off tickets alone, concluded Padavan, means that New Yorkers have the opportunity to gamble 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But gambling in New York is unconstitutional. In his 2012 State of the State Address, Governor Cuomo acknowledged this uh, ridiculousness by saying, when it comes to gaming, we have been in a state of denial. 
It's time we confronted reality. It's not a question of whether we should have gaming in New York. The fact is we already do. Native Americans have five casinos in New York. We have nine racinos at our racetracks. We don't fully realize it, regulate it, or capitalize it on it, but we have gaming. In part, as a result of his support, New York State voters will be presented with a ballot question in November about whether to allow <clears throat> casino gambling. If you could indulge me, I want to take a little detour into political analysis for just a minute. The question reads, the proposed amendment to Section 9 of Article 1 of the Constitution would allow the legislature to authorize up to seven casinos in New York State for the legislated pur purposes <clears throat> of promoting growth increasing aid to schools, and permitting local governments to local lower property taxes through revenues generated. Shall the amendment be approved? As Eleanor Randolph observed recently in the New York Times blog, the way the question is worded, quote, makes it sound fabulous, hard to resist. As an Albany observer, let me say that the way the question is worded also gives us, the public, a peek behind the curtain. You have to ask yourself, why is it that Governor Cuomo would allow a question to be so transparently biased? It could be that he's concerned that without such wording, voters will be giving the gambling question two thumbs down. As you know, New York City's mayoral race is the biggest vote draw this year. And gambling doesn't do much for that city. Maybe he doesn't want to depend exclusively on New York City voters. There are other possible reasons for the hard sell, too. Governor Cuomo may feel that he has to overcome his lack of action on fracking. Casino gambling is considered a way to create economic development, that's in quotes, in upstate New York's most moribund communities. It could be that projected revenues from casinos have already been factored into future budgets, not necessarily the state budget, but how about some of those southern tier counties that are having trouble paying all of that Medicaid uh, payment that they owe to the state? It could be that the windfall of lobbying money from gambling interests is just so enticing. Or it could be all of the above, combined with the fact that our elected officials have had to dance around that damn gambling provision in the state constitution for so long that given an opportunity to eradicate it, they are taking no chances. A less well-known example of a constitutional provision deemed so inconvenient that politicians regularly, regularly circumvent it is the provision requiring a public vote to borrow money and exceed the debt limit. It's less understood than the gambling provision, more frequently ab abused, and more corrosive to democracy. In January of this year, the New York State Comptroller's Office issued a report on the state's debt which is the highest, second highest in the nation after California. At the time, Tom DiNapoli said, New York's past borrowing is limiting our future options. We spend billions each year to repay existing debt, so fewer resources are available for more pressing needs. This comes at a challenging time when our state needs to rebuild and repair critical infrastructure and has growing capital needs. You might be wondering, how this could be if the state constitution says the taxpayers are supposed to approve any borrowing the state does. I'm a taxpayer. I'm pretty sure that I haven't been asked to approve any state borrowing since 2005's Transportation Bond Act. The answer is that we don't get asked, or rarely. Our elected officials circumvent voters. They circumvent us via backdoor borrowing which means they use the borrowing powers of quasi-public authorities like the Metropolitan Transportation Authority or the New York Power Authority to get at what they need. While NIPA and MTA are frequently tapped, politicians have over 700 public authorities to choose from. It's like they have 700 cookie jars and they have no mom to say enough. According to the New York Times, these authorities have functioned, quote, as a virtual shadow government, largely immune to public accountability. In 2009, Governor Patterson signed into law some reforms to the state's public authorities. They don't go very far, although now these authorities can no longer sell real estate for less than the market value. That's public land that, that, that's supposed to be, you know, ours. They were selling it for less than the public, the going market rate. 
It's something that the Metropolitan Transportation Authority did when it sold the rights to build over rail yards in Brooklyn to the developers of Atlantic Yards. <clears throat> Anybody been there? <clears throat> That's your tax dollars. Even with the reforms, it's 2013 and nearly 95% of state borrowing over the last 10 years has been through these public authorities. Controller DiNapoli is calling for a bunch of reforms, one of which is a constitutional ban on backdoor borrowing. Another is a provision requiring new types of state debt to be approved by the legislature and the voters before being issued by the controller. We'll see if either of those ideas gains any traction. Meanwhile, the next time you and I will be asked about state borrowing will probably be in 2014 when a $5 billion environmental bond act is destined to be put before the voters. As an aside, every time I hear about state borrowing, the movie Jurassic Park pops into my mind. Remember how, even though the dinosaurs were all the same sex, I can't remember if they're all women or all men or <laughs> dinosaurs, but they they were designed as, you know, single-sex creatures so they wouldn't procreate. Yet they found a way to procreate. Jeff Bloom says, you know, very mysteriously, life will find a way. That's what I think of when attempts are made to stop politicians from borrowing without the public's consent. Like the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, elected officials will find a way. That said, while our politicians are indeed the ones doing the backdoor borrowing, the actual circumventing of the Constitution, the public has played a role by not protesting all that loudly. You might think, why should we? Some parts of the state's Constitution are out of date. It's a document that was originally drafted in 1894. It was overhauled once in the 1930s, and updated a few times since then, but it's not a document that speaks to us in the language of 2013. Unlike the US Constitution, the state constitution is vague in a bad way, and its words don't carry the same power that its big brother at the federal level does. Additionally, when it comes to gambling, my sense is that contemporary New Yorkers are much more tolerant than they were 100 years ago. Also, why protest another Racino when your kids' teachers are being laid off, when your 401k plan has lost 50% of its value, and they stopped paving the potholes outside of your office? We all have other fish to fry. The borrowing issue is more difficult. New Yorkers don't have time to pay attention to the slights of hand performed by every backwater solid waste authority issuing bonds. And if the public is unaware, where does the outrage come from? And I don't have to tell any of you in this room that there are too few reporters digging into issues like public authorities financing to ring that bell. So the status quo lives. I don't want you to think that the state constitution is completely worthless. It's absolutely not. It strengthens plenty of issues that certain groups of New Yorkers consider to be critical threads in the fabric that makes New York special. Pension protections, labor organizing, the forever wild provision protecting the Adirondacks, the rights of the needy, the state's requirements around education, all worthy topics. Yet the conventional wisdom is that change is desperately needed. Thankfully, the state constitution provides for that change. This is a good time to share what some of the people I spoke with about the state constitution said to me in less guarded moments. One called the New York State Constitution an anachronism. One said it's something New Yorkers should be ashamed of. And one simply said, why is there so much crap in this document? You can laugh. The crap comment relates narrowly to a provision in the Constitution that requires state lawmakers to receive a paper version of every bill. On November's ballot, thankfully, one of the six questions we'll all be asked is whether to allow lawmakers to receive these bills electronically. It's 2013. But indeed, the bigger question is why does our Constitution deal with such minutia? Or, again, why is there so much crap in this document? Perhaps the problem lies with its uh, attempts to micromanage things. 
It's a document that's 55,326 words long. It needs to be reviewed. It's our state constitution. It should matter. Thankfully, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Constitution provides two ways to make updates, by legislative proposal, which would tackle problems piecemeal, or by constitutional convention, which would provide an opportunity for a complete review. Neither avenue allows for speedy changes, which is understandable. Modifying a Constitution should not be taken lightly. Both methods take passage by two consecutive legislatures and approval by voters, a process that takes at least two years because each legislative session is two years long. Just a little background, 2013-2014 is considered a single legislative session. 2015-2016 will be the next legislative session. If, for example, lawmakers approve a constitutional change when they come back in January 2014, they do it again in 2015, the start of the new session, they would have met the provision requiring passage by two consecutive legislatures. That change would then have to be approved by us, the voters, in order for it to be successful. Constitutionally, New Yorkers get an opportunity to say whether they want a constitutional convention every 20 years. The last time voters were asked this question was 1997, and they said no. Many attribute that no vote to a barrage of negative ads by unions like NYSA, New York State United Teachers, as well as a campaign against the convention by good government groups, including the League of Women Voters. Now, you might be scratching your head. Why would a reform group like the League of Women Voters lobby against an opportunity for reform? Chalk it up to convention, constitution convention phobia which I'll get to in a minute. First, let's recall what happened the last time New York actually held a constitutional convention. It was 1967. 186 delegates were elected to serve in that convention, a total made up of three delegates per the 57 Senate districts that were in place at the time, plus 15 at-large delegates. The delegates were primarily elected officials from the Senate and the Assembly. The convention chair was Tony Travia, the assembly speaker. The convention minority leader was Earl Bridges, the president pro tem of the Senate. Reform groups like the League of Women Voters point to the 67 convention when arguing the delegate selection process has to be changed before another convention is held. They want a people's constitutional convention, not a politician's constitutional convention. That said, uh, some of the proposals to come out of the 67 convention had some promise. Um, delegates proposed a state takeover of the costs of both the court system and the welfare system. I can't ever imagine that happening right now. <laughs> they also proposed that lawmakers be allowed to incur debt without referendum. They didn't need to do that. What de derailed the vote, according to some historians, was an attempt to repeal the Blaine Amendment, which prohibited the state from funding paro parochial schools. It was a, an issue that was very important to Tony Travia, who was a religious Catholic, um, head of the convention. Uh, Travia wanted to eliminate Blaine, which he saw as a vestige of anti-immigrant sentiment. The Fiscal Policy Institute's Frank Morrow recalled that the convention secretary, the late Bob Herman, told him that the conventional wisdom at the time was if all of the changes were packaged together because they lumped everything into one giant omnibus bill, okay, and the public had to vote yay or nay. So the conventional wisdom was that the public would find various reasons to vote yes. Instead, the public found various reasons to vote no and in November of 1967, voters rejected the new Constitution. The next opportunity to decide whether we want a constitutional convention will be in 2017. Don't assume that New Yorkers will say yes. That yes vote that led to the 67 convention was typical of referenda in New York. It passed overwhelmingly in more progressive New York City, but failed elsewhere around the state. 
766,000 New York City voters said they wanted a constitutional convention. 500,000 said no. Outside of New York City, those numbers were flipped with fewer voting casts. While voters in 67 said, we want a convention, they said no to that question in 77. And later on, I'll tell you why they had one in 67 and then 77, even though it's every 20 years. Um, they also said no in 97. There are plenty of reasons to say no again. The cost, for example, is always an issue. The location, where would it be held? The last convention took place in the assembly chamber. Um, uh, the assembly, the convention lasted from April through September. And this is back in the day when the assembly and the Senate would adjourn after the budget was passed on you know, March 31st, April 1st. They don't do that anymore. Sometimes they don't even pass a budget by that time. So who knows where they would even um, to have this convention take place. And it's not just like a day-long convention or a weekend convention like you think in Las Vegas, you know. This is a convention that it's like coming to work every day for four months in the same place. Um, then there's the issue around those 15 at-large candidates. In, deci in Decision 97, which if you're interested <coughs> in this topic is just amazing to read, um, Columbia Law School's Richard Griffo wrote, the central problem with at-large or multi-member systems is that they extend the party of the majority's domination. Um, I'm sorry, they extend the party of the majority's domination, therefore making it difficult for minorities um, than for whites to elect representatives of their own choosing. So, you know, you have the cost, you have the logistics of the whole thing, you have this taint of racism any one of these issues could be enough to tip the scales against a constitutional convention. But it's a constitution day, so we're going to be optimistic. If voters say yes in 2017, delegates to the convention will be elected in 2018. The convention itself will begin in Albany on Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019. Sounds far away, I know but reformers are urging the public to pay attention now. Part of the reason for that is that constitutional convention phobia that I mentioned. That was actually the name of a paper written jointly by Drs. Thomas Gase and Jerry Benjamin in 96. The paper explored why fear of conventions exist at both the national and state levels. In New York, the fear comes out of the delegate selection process. In theory, that process should permit anyone to run. But in practice, it looks exactly like any other election. It's very partisan. And as I have mentioned before, the delegates are selected via Senate district, as well as 15 statewide at-large delegates. The result would be a slate of delegates that looks very similar to the current sitting legislature. I mean, the, the next leaders of the Constitutional Convention, if nothing changes, could very well be Sheldon Silver and Dean Scalos. Good government groups like NYPIRG and others want to use the next convention to really improve the state's constitution. It's time. They want to streamline it. They want to fix the state's redistricting problems. They want to change its arcane election laws. They want to amend how the state budget process works, shift the state's fiscal year. Some reformers want initiative and referendum in New York. Others want term limits. And it is all possible, says Frank Morrow, but not with the current delegate selection process. If the delegate selection process were to be overhauled, first passage, because it's in the Constitution, has to take place next year, 2014, which means the public has to start paying attention now. To borrow again from Geis and Benjamin, this time from a paper they wrote for the Temple Law Review in 1995, how can states respond to demands for fundamental changes in a thoughtful, deliberative manner if many of the same political problems and public attitudes that give rise to those demands also block traditional channels for addressing them? Think about it. It's a great question, and it needs to be answered soon. If you're wondering why reformers didn't change the delegate selection process in the years leading up to the 1997 Constitutional Convention, the answer in part, according to Blair Horner of Nyberg, was that they just didn't have their act together. 
He recalls a reporter in the mid-90s asking then-Senate Majority Leader Joe Bruno about changing the delegate selection process, and Bruno's response was something like, why are we even thinking about that now? That's not for years. Of course, when 1997 rolled around, it was too late. Horner puts it like this to me. The world will say it's way too early to start thinking about a constitutional convention now. In three years, the world will say it's much too late to begin thinking about a constitutional convention now. Frank Morrow agrees, saying constitutional convention would be a good way to consider important changes, but changes need, need to be made prior. And if changes aren't made, the likely outcome of any convention would be an abomination. In conclusion, in 1997, New York State United Teachers was strongly opposed to a state constitutional convention because every section of the state constitution would be open, quote, endangering worker and pension rights. NYSUT considered opening up the Constitution to be like opening up Pandora's box. Whether you agree with NYSUT's position or not, the circumstances don't have to be what they were in 1997. If we can get the delegate selection process right, if the rules around the convention include deliberation, if we give the process enough time to fully review the entire document, we have the chance to rebuild the foundation of the Empire State. As we speak, there are bills in both houses that would do that. But whether they go anywhere depends on the legislature. I end with the same borrowed question that I posed before. How can states respond to demands for fundamental changes in a thoughtful, deliberative manner if many of the same political problems and public attitudes that gave rise to those demands also block traditional channels for addressing them. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm happy to take questions. Please, as soon as you can just call on people, just raise your hand for a question. Can you talk a little bit more about the vagueness between the national, you said that the vagueness in the state constitution is bad, but not the national government constitution. And I, is that just because of the policies that come out of it? Like what? From what I understand, okay, and again, not a scholar, but from what I understand, the federal constitution is, you know, it's short. It's, an, it's a framework. That's why they call it the framers of the constitution. So if you think of it like a house, it's got really good bones, and as culture and society uh, progress and grow and change, you could add different elements to the house, okay? The New York State Constitution is already this big, vast, sprawling McMansion from hell, okay? And it, it is, it, it like, it tells you that you have to put the, every single lawmaker has to have copies of every single bill on their desk for three days, or you have to have a message of necessity to pass a bill. That is so problematic on so many levels. Not only cost-wise, but we have entire departments at the Capitol that deal with that volume of paper. Think about the numbers of forests we've destroyed just so some assemblyman who's never going to read that document gets to see it on his desk, the stack, this is high. It's crazy. And then the idea of a message of necessity? I think we're one of two states that has that, and that's something that Andrew Cuomo utilized during the New York Safe Act, just to like get it done before you know, anyone raised hell. Yeah, okay, there, is a, there are no provisions for what happens if the governor steps down and the lieutenant governor has to become governor, so who's lieutenant governor? which actually happened when Elliot Spitzer went down in flanks. We didn't know what, happened, what was going to happen with Richard Ravitch. So, you know, I, in my opinion, thankfully, the, the Court of Appeals said Richard Ravitch could be the, the lieutenant governor. But that could have gone either way. And it could have been Pedro Espada. <laughs> So you kind of, you finish with a call to arms and this opportunity for change, but 
how do you translate that into action for the citizenry or from the legislature if it's maybe not a, a need that a lot of people can identify with? You know, you're t you're, I mean, people, it's not like schools or the economy. You have all these other things around Well, people's. that's, you see, it's everything. It's it, it, the, the Constitution in New York allows for a lot of underhanded uh, manipulation of the system by people in power. And those loopholes need to be closed. Um, things like, you know, why should we have to have legislature, legislators um, determine redistricting? Okay, I think that, you know, Common Cause came out with great lines. Okay, they were fair, they didn't violate, you know, all of the rules and regulations that they say that they can't violate, and it would have meant one person, one vote. Now we have these politically drawn lines that make sure that downstate minorities don't get the same volume of say as upstate, upstate communities. If it's one person, one vote, you're allowed to have this 10% swing either way in population. So if you live in Hamilton County, where there's like four people, you get Betty Little. But if you live in Brooklyn, where there's, you know, 100 million people, you, you get, you know, whatever you get, Eric Adams or something. And it's not equal. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not, it's against one person, one vote. Yet somehow they've figured out a way around that too. There's just so many different ways to circumvent what's in the Constitution. It just needs to be sewn up tighter. So, Susan, what gives you confidence that if it were sewn up tighter, that life wouldn't find a way and we wouldn't just be having a beautiful constitution? I have absolutely no confidence okay. in that whatsoever. I'm <laughs> sure okay. life will find a way. Okay. But it'll just be harder, and maybe some people will pay more attention, which is you know, the bane of my existence. If people, even, no matter how many times I say it on the radio or my colleagues in the press room print it in their papers, or they say it on TV, whatever. If people aren't paying attention, nothing changes. You know, the same people get elected. It's easier to die than get voted out of office in the state of New York. Um, a couple of questions. I wonder if you can give us a little bit more detail about the difference in vote results between New York City and the rest of the state, because you mentioned there's a difference. Yeah, there is. There's, and then yeah. the other question is, uh, I wonder if you can also tell us a little bit about the process once the Constitutional Convention happens, because to me it seems like there's so many people, that just three people to agree on going to a restaurant is hard enough. I can't imagine, you know, hundreds of people talking about the Constitution, which is even more complicated. Why does it have to be that big? Well. Um, let me just say that I don't have the answer to your second okay. question. <laughs> okay. and thank God I don't have to come up with it. But, um, I, I, you know, there are people who do that for a living. Um, there's some, there, isn't there an organization that talks about how to deliberate? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and there's actually one that has a um, CNY Speaks, there's a local one. Oh, people. okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I didn't know that. That's interesting. But, you know, you just, it, it, you have to, you have to have ground rules. You don't want Robert's rules of order because you're never going to get it done. But you have to have certain goals, for mm. example. So that's, that's all I can really say about the second part of your question. But um, the first part, there's a name for it. Of course, I can't remember it right now. But in the, the reapportionment, you know, every 10 years we have a census and they count up all the people and then they divide up the um, congressional districts and the Senate districts and the assembly districts into equal um, segments. So we have, uh, how many Senate districts do we have? 63, okay, 63 Senate districts. Each, I'm not sure what the number is, but let's just say that each Senate district has 300,000 people in it. On the federal level, you have to be 
within one person. So, you, who, who is your senator here? Um, Maffei. Yeah. So Maffei's district and Reed's district are exactly the same amount of people, give or take one. In New York State, that difference is 10% either way. So it's a 5% swing more or a 5% swing less. And because the lawmakers draw their own lines, they get out their GIS, okay, and they do this. This isn't just like, let's just draw the line like this. No, they have statistical analyses that would make NASA blush <laughs> to make sure that every single household that they think is going to be a good voter for them, it's a, an incumbent protection racket. And this is what they do. I, I have a political question to ask. Um, over say, the last 12 years, there have been changes by the, uh, the political leaders, except for one, and that would be the Assembly Speaker, Sheldon Shelley Silver. Do you see any likelihood that he will be replaced somehow or someone will supplant That's him. the $64,000 question, isn't it? And if so, who, who might that be or who would possible successor be? We should invite you to our uh, Friday night, you know, parties <laughs> and all the journalists get together. Yeah, this is what we talk about. I don't have the answer, but I can guess, you know, some of the people that I speak to think Joe Morelli, Others say, no way, it's got to be a downstate person of color, or it's got to be a woman, or blah, 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 blah. There's so, there are so many different, it's New York. I mean, ethnic politics, regardless of what Sam Roberts in the New York Times says, ethnic politics is still alive in New York. That will be a factor. But I don't think that Sheldon Silver is going anywhere anytime soon. Because, because the Senate... The Senate isn't stable yet. It's still, you know, like one, there are two two elections. Eric Adams and uh, Dan Squadron are Senate Dems. They both ran for city council or public advocate or something, and they won. So now you have these two seats. They're in Democratic districts, but still, all right. You got these two open seats unless Cuomo calls for a special election. So, um, basically, if I'm losing my train of thought here, but, but, you know, the Senate needs to be stable before Cuomo can say Shelley has to go because he needs a partner in getting his uh, priority list done. Do you see what I'm saying? And if neither of the, uh, the houses are functioning houses, <coughs> then, you know, his, his agenda goes nowhere. And there's like no President Cuomo. And, and if I could, is there still, um, because of this area here in Syracuse and Central New York, we all in a certain age, I guess, remember Mike Bradman's ill fated coup, which oh, yeah. effectively ended Mike Bradman's political career. Is there still some aftermath from that that people are saying? My friend know? Eric Chris used to work for the Post Standard, and uh, when he heard that. For some stupid reason, Eric, or Michael Bradman announced to the world that he was going to do this. What was this coup? I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, for people who don't know, um, the reason, part of the reason why it's so dysfunctional in the le legislature is that the, uh, that the leadership controls everything. So each of the houses has a leader. They control all the pork. They control who gets the chairmanships. They control what committee you're on. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. All, all of the above. So, um, Mike Bragman was a Democrat from Syracuse. And he didn't like Sheldon Silver's strong arm style. And he, one Friday night, he announced that he was going to challenge him. Like, you know, have a coup d'etat. Well, you know, lesson number one in political 
analysis. Don't tell people that you're going to try to overthrow <laughs> two days before. So anyway, he gets Shelley gets all of his people in order, and Mike Bragman is smashed down. All of his committee assignments are taken away, and he's banished to Siberia. So my on that Friday, my friend Eric Chris tells the story. He used to write for the Post Standard. He's in the LCA press room, and he says, wow, Bradman is thinking about taking on Shelley. This is great for me. And right then, Pat Lynch walked in the door, and he never got another interview with Shelley Silver, <laughs> 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 who still hates him to this day. I listen to your show very often. Uh, anyway, I drive for my kids. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry I missed uh, so by this interview. Oh, <laughs> this much. Uh, oh. I found a very interesting topic uh, some days ago, uh, some time ago, uh, public financing of campaign. So, uh, <coughs> governor was uh, governor was pushing really hard to get it done. Right? Is he? Yeah. <laughs> but where is it going, the issue of uh, the public financing campaign? And uh, the second one is, uh, do you think it can be done under the current uh, New York Constitution, or do we need any uh, constitutional amendment for public financing of a campaign? The issue you mentioned, the gambling, fracking, or public authority financing, all are related with uh, the campaign money, right? Changes are needed, but they can't be done because of the financing, of the finance of the campaign. Right? It's a huge. It's, well, it's the it mother going, of all issues. Is it going nowhere or anywhere? Um, I don't know. Out of all of the issues that are facing New York, this is the most critical issue because while elected officials are beholden to moneyed interests, they cannot also serve the public. You cannot have two masters, okay? So, <laughs> this is such an entrenched problem in Albany that I don't know, even if Governor Cuomo put all of his political capital behind this push, which he has not, okay, I'm not sure if there will ever be public financing it with a, uh, a Republican Senate, because philosophically, um, the Republicans say, why should the public pay for politicians' campaigns? In a, for, you know, if you look at it practically, that amount of money that would be spent is a pittance. It's it's buckus, okay, but. It's still, they don't, they, they don't want to relinquish that. Now, I don't know if that's a pretense. It's not for me to say. But that's what they're saying. It could be because a lot of the moneyed interests back some of the status quo. So why would they want public campaign finance? Look at what they get. You know, the, the, the three very wealthy luxury real estate moguls basically got their own law written for them. And this is how it works. <coughs> I'm glad that you asked. I hope it happens. Uh, with regard to the media, uh, you spoke about the, uh, the delegates and the awareness of you know, change in the delegates with regards to the Constitution uh, Convention. How much do you think the media plays a role in that, as opposed to, let's say, the citizens are lobbying for certain delegates to be elected, you know, for certain uh, legislatures to be elected and then brought into the process? Because I know, like, I'm from Brooklyn, and they always say New Yorkers live fast lives in the city. You know, they don't really pay attention. They'll pick up the paper or whatever's there, skim through it. How much do you think the media plays a role in that? Um, if... If I understand your question, I guess it's that, uh, do, you know, I think that the media plays a role in, in everything, mm -hmm. but in, a, in the Constitutional Convention question, um, 
it's, it's a complicated issue, and there are too few reporters to tackle all of the important issues that need to be tackled. Um, state, um, state house reporters are dwindling. You have to file a, a story every day or two or three, whatever, and you don't have enough time to really study something like this. I, I bet there are some people who cover state government that don't realize the time frame that we're into here. But that said, it's our job to do that. You know, we watch. We're supposed to be aware of what's happening. And uh, for me, I don't have like an editor that tells me, well, you can't talk about the Constitutional Convention again, Susan. But, you know, the New York Times guy can't just write about the Constitutional Convention every day. The Newsday guy can't. The AP guy can't. So, yeah, you know, a lot depends on how, you know, what the attitude is among the edit editors. <laughs> you know? And just, you know, hopefully people pay attention. I always hope people pay attention. I don't think that that is a biased statement or anything. I just, just ha be aware of what's happening, you know? So tell people in Rome. <laughs> we still have a few minutes. Additional questions? You can also ask about, you know, politics or anything. So Susan, uh, you mentioned a couple of efforts, one in 67, and I think the other one was in 93 that really didn't go anywhere. But if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned that one of the reasons why it failed is because there was some concern from the unions and the teachers that there will be harm somehow. Right. So my question is, we've gone through one of the biggest crises, you know, since the 1930s, and I don't know to what extent unions today are more or less powerful. So the question is, do you think if there was an effort this time around, those concerns of then will apply today as well? They will absolutely apply today. Because municipal governments like Detroit are going bankrupt, because the city of Syracuse, for example, is upside down, Stephanie Miner says. She says that because there's more money that is owed to retired cops and firefighters than she pays out for firefighters and cops who are actually working right now. So there are pension obligations, health care obligations there. But the pension obligations are constitutionally protected. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is a huge issue. Oh, They're afraid that if you open it up, you're going to get people saying, well, I don't want to protect that constitution. The Adirondackers are, you know, I don't, why should we have to have a, a park like this? I mean, there's no gate. Why do we have to have this constitutionally protected thing? We also have that CFE lawsuit, the Campaign for Fiscal Equity lawsuit, that says every child is uh, owed a sound, ba a sound basic education, I think is what it says. And uh, they can remove that from the Constitution. I mean, somebody who is irresponsible could do a real number on it. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the unions have every reason mm -hmm. to be even more concerned than they were in 1997 when we were like flying high on Wall Street during mm -hmm. the tech bump. Mm -hmm. Now things aren't like that. But they, I mean, we could raise bankruptcy as well, given the debt level, right? And then if we raise bankruptcy, then all those patients, protected or not, might be addressed. Well, we don't know that. Right? That's actually going to go to the, that's going to go to the Supreme Court. That's what somebody predicted. <laughs> Richard Ravitch predicted that. Too. He's a former lieutenant governor, municipal finance expert, used to head the MTA. I trust what this guy says. He's like 8,000 years old. <laughs> he said that, oh, and he was also the guy that saved, helped to save New York City during the 1970 bankruptcy crisis. He said that if, let's say Syracuse goes bankrupt, in bankruptcy, you have somebody who comes in and manages the bankruptcy and <coughs> says, well, you get this much, you take this sort of haircut, you take that haircut. So the, the debtor, the, the, the bank, take a haircut, 
and the pensioner, right. the retirees would take a haircut. But if it's a constitutionally protected pension, what does that mean? Interestingly enough, Detroit, in Michigan, it's the only other state, or there might be a, two other states, Illinois also, have constitutionally protected pensions. But they're taking a haircut anyway. So that's where it's going to like wind up into the Supreme Court. It'll be like the Detroit Teachers Union versus whoever that bankruptcy guy is. Wow. But that's a that's a good one to watch. I'm psyched for that one. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, you guys have been great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.